just wanted to. Uh, oh, wow. Well, that issue, that's the second issue. The first issue was Star Wars, of course, because Starburst came out for Star Wars. And it, yeah. But we like Yamato a lot better than Star Wars back then. <laughs> oh, okay, so I've got questions for all three of you. So when you first started developing the audio drama, did you find that the story translated to this medium seamlessly or were there unexpected challenges? I think that's Fred's. Okay, question. sure. Go ahead. Uh, this is like the most perfect story for audio. I mean, it, I don't know. It's sort of hard to explain how, what kind of uh, weird brain you have to have to like love this art form so much. But like, what, it's like you read things and like the movie starts appearing in your mind. Um, so there's certain certain material that um, when when the idea that an ElfQuest audio movie could be a thing, looking at those comics, it was like I could hear it in my head immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. And the world of two moons just, you know, and the voices like the, it, it just all sort of coalesced very magically and very quickly. Um, I think and, perhaps one reason for that is when I write, I say the dialogue out loud. I act out the scene to see if the dialogue flows. And I think that's that's why it might be pretty easy to uh, read the dialogue. Yeah, and it's uh, like there is a lot of action in ElfQuest, but it's really a character driven story. And there is a lot of uh, a lot of like the tension in the story are kind of like philosophical types of questions and things that you know like words and story you know the, the words drive a lot of of what the how, how the story moves uh and and i will also say the the fact that it's this huge epic saga works really well like there are are plenty of comics that have great you know issues but then to make this like longer product is is going to be a challenge because you have so many actors or you have so many different roles that keep receding whereas in this we are with these characters for this extremely long journey. So um, yeah, I, I think it works well. I know a lot of the fans have been asking, like obviously Wendy's art is so spellbinding, like how is that gonna translate in the audio? So we, we have that challenge of how do we create a sound environment that right. gives tribute to that. Um, and I, But I will say one of the other things that was really wonderful here is they have a companion novel. So the there will be a lot of, um, both kind of expanded world material that are not in the original comics, as well as just the literal language from those um, Journey to Sorrow's End novel that gives us, um, you know, that just sort of just, just the voice of those novels is makes it into the audio piece, into the scripts. Mm -hmm. And that that allows us sort of paint the paint the picture. So there's a lot of, you know, sound effects and music and, and the score and all that that will, you know, give that the vibe of the what the art does. Mm -hmm. um, but then also uh, the way the narrative device will work and all the words from those from the novel help you know, really flesh out and add the the part that you won't see because you're not gonna have the visual component so my absolutely. job is kind of, kind of to be script editor um, uh, the scripts are wonderful uh, they're really faithful to the source material but at the same time there's additional new material that just fits right in and so my job is just to kind of go over the script and make sure the voices are right and that all the characters are actually in character. Right, right, right. That's, yeah, that actually covers my next question for you, for you three, which was kind of which other, like, like is this going to be super faithful to the original story or is, is there going to be a lot of new stuff? Well, as Wendy has said, and as we have said many, many times when ElfQuest has been adapted, yeah. Uh, ElfQuest is infinitely malleable uh, for adaptation. Yeah. Um, it's the voice and the vibe of the story that is the most important thing. And working with Fred and his crew of writers and adapters, we are coming to discover that, um, as, as we like to say, comic book is comic book and audio drama is audio drama and they are related but they are not slavishly faithful back right. and forth to each other right uh, there are some i will call them tricks being uh, uh done to make the 
visual aspect of the comic and the uh, verbal aspect of the novelizations become a very powerful and seamless audio drama of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So it is faithful, but it's not word for word going to follow exactly right. what read in the comics or even the novel. Right, but 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 the spirit of the of the original story is very much there. Well, the the entire original story is there. I mean, you're going to go through it with the characters. It That's really it, it it makes it very personal. I've I've been extremely happy with the first five episodes, which cover the first five comics in the series, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole thing is is entitled Journey to Sorrow's End. Yeah, and uh, so. It, you know, to be able to work with people who really get it and, and are able to translate it so well, this is a thrill. That's, that's all. So it, it, it sounds like, you know, on Fred's end too, that everyone involved is just so passionate and in love with the project, which I really like to see. And I think that um, I'm really excited for it. I actually just bought, rebought an omnibus of uh, ElfQuest like three days ago. So... <laughs> And I've been rereading it. I'm actually at the Sorrow's End part. So I just started it. So again, and yeah. it's really, really good. Your art is just so beautiful. And it's, the writing is just, it's just so rich, you know? Like, it's so good. Well, we started 43 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, 43 years ago, we were different people, but ElfQuest has remained pretty phenomenally consistent over the years. I, I think that's been very important to us that, that we just maintain the brand, maintain the look of the characters. I've tried different drawing styles mm -hmm. over the years, uh, but, but I've never strayed so far off model that the characters were unrecognizable. And uh, right. that's been very important to us to keep the characters so familiar that anytime someone picks up a book, they feel like they're coming home to family. Absolutely. I think that um, I had a, so this is actually a question I really wanted to ask you guys. So fantasy is my favorite genre. Mm -hmm. And I think that you're able to have really real and really, really honest conversations about what's happening in the real world through fantastical worlds. And I think that, you know, ElfQuest has obviously been around for a very long time. It's it started a, lo a lot of conversations and stuff. How is the conversation, how has it maybe um, furthered the conversation or how has it, uh, you know, how has the conversation evolved through ElfQuest? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Um, the best fantasies are the ones that are truthful, but just dressed up in metaphor. Yes. And when we started ElfQuest, Wendy had the original seed of the story. We just wanted to tell the story. And it was a, a smaller tale of the way we were growing, the, the problems we too faced as individuals and as a couple. Um, it was a more personal metaphor. As the uh, saga evolved, we discovered through a lot of wonderful feedback that the basic premise of ElfQuest, which is looking for a safe place, looking for home, looking for others of your kind, yeah. uh, inclusivity, um, finding community with others who think and feel like you, that, those concepts have become so much more crucial and so much more in the public view now than ever they were back in the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we we look at each other sometimes and are amazed that uh, ElfQuest feels more relevant now to yeah. the world that we inhabit yeah. than it did when we started it. And so ElfQuest is, is, feels more crucial, more necessary, more, uh, 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 beneficial, if you will, yeah, for today's world than 40 years ago. 
Well, it was born in the era of bell bottoms and fringe and hippie mm -hmm. flower love and the Vietnam War and Nixon and Watergate and you know, yeah. you name it. And can you imagine how amazed we are to find that we are dealing even more fiercely now with the same issues in which ElfQuest was born 43 years ago. Yeah. It's, we thought by now racial prejudice and ho homophobia and, and hatreds of all kinds and bigotries of all kinds would have been abolished by now. Yeah. And, and here we are uh, in our 70s finding out <laughs> that, um, you know. The more things change, the, the more, more they stay the they same. They stay the same. And so, so the relevance of ElfQuest is... The elves represent any mar marginalized group that has yeah. ever been persecuted for their um, for their differences. And, and and this leads back to our excitement at the project, at the audio movie project, because we love to recycle. Mm -hmm. uh, Elf Quest as a comic has been reformatted, recolored, republished many many times, each time for a new audience each time for a new social world. Um, but this is the first time, excluding a, a simple audiobook reading that was done 30 plus years ago, um, that ElfQuest, the wonderful melding of words and pictures that are the comics, is going to go into a third dimension of sound and music and music and sound effects that speaks to the imagination right in a completely new and very powerful way mm. right yeah that's that's amazing and i think that kind of circling back and i've got a question for fred here in a second but one of the things that i've noticed about elf quest and its themes is that the world's kind of you know, rushing to meet ElfQuest where it's at rather than ElfQuest rushing to meet us, you know, you know what I mean? Us where we're yeah. at. Like, it was saying these things were important before we really fully realized that they were important, mm -hmm. I think. Or, or, mm -hmm. or, or maybe before we realized that they would be such a big, you know, part of our, of our world. Yeah. As Wendy said, who would have thought 40 plus years later that we're confronting the same issues even more in, in a, your face in a more yeah. extreme form. in a more extreme form than we did these were things that were important to us they still are important to us yeah and that's why the story has the the consistency of tone and feeling um but the world seems to have said uh we we need the lessons or the 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 empathies of ElfQuest now more than ever. Well, yeah. this goes back to what you were saying about um, ElfQuest kind of having a social conscience. Yeah. Uh, we never wanted to be a message story. Um, we agree with you completely that fantasy is, um, you know, just one of the most delightful uh, types of literature to get lost in. Yeah. You know, and kind of, kind of get away from the the everyday world but at the same time it reflects the everyday world it's it does it's sort of a metaphor for what's going on it it's does and, and i and i relate i think a lot of people relate to the elves because there's a lot of um you know there's a lot of resonance and relevance within just that group and i think that you know i so i have autism a very mild form of autism and so i um have definitely dealt with being marginalized. And um, so I, I guess all that to say, I really connected with what you guys are saying. And mm. I really think that it's a really beautiful message and it's given me a lot of comfort in some really, really dark times. So um, when, when I felt like the world didn't understand me, you know, and, yeah. but, I, but there was a comic. So it's ElfQuest is one of the two comics that has really, really resonated with me. The other one is Jeff Smith's Bone series. Yes. Um, yeah. Much for very similar, they're very empathetic, very kind stories. Um, yes. But I wanted to, um, Fred, so um, I think what I wanted to ask you is what can, what can ElfQuest fans expect 
from this audio drama? How many episodes is it? Like, what's the, you know, for the format, what's the structure? Sure. So um, where we're at is that um, we're, we're in motion to produce the first five issues comics, um, which uh, also tracks with the novelization Journey of Sorrow's End. And um, we're, we're, we're doing this sort of thing where you like, you take the first step and then you hope that the, the stairway appears um, right. approach with, with the fan base. So the way we've architected this whole thing uh, and part of like kind of why the person who connected uh, me with, with Richard and Wendy said like, you just, you both of you have this sort of like independent spirit. Like you just like, we're not going like a traditional publisher route with ElfQuest, just like you wouldn't expect that to be the way. Um, so what we're doing, so you know, rather than say, okay, we'll go to like a big company and we're gonna like make the thing and it's gonna be a book and it's, you gotta be on this paid platform. We're going for a uh, approach that will allow us to make ElfQuest uh, ultimately available to a pretty wide audience, but using the fan support, architecting the fan support to make that happen. Um, so that's kind of what we'll be talking more details about tomorrow. But basically, um, so we have a pretty exciting sort of, you know, call it crowdfunding campaign, but it's really about community campaign. It's really about like coalescing um, all this, the people who have this, you know, ElfQuest has meant so much to, to feel mm -hmm. part of this journey. So what we're ultimately ha hoping will happen is that the fan base is there to help us uh, build up a train that allows us to keep going beyond yeah. these first five. So that's, that's what we're hoping. We're hoping that um, people are, are going to get a taste for what a fun adventure this could be. And we'll all get tickets and be on the train together. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that what's really exciting for me is seeing this beloved story kind of take new life in another medium, but you, so actually in my original set of questions, Fred, I quoted you, cause in the press release I received, you said that it sounds counterintuitive, but audio drama is actually an enormously visual medium. So the question in my mind becomes not how, and you guys might've already answered this, please tell me if you have, but it becomes not how does the audio movie translate a visual medium into an auditory one, but rather, how does ElfQuest medium hop while keeping that vital visual mm. element intact? Oh, medium hop. Medium babe. hop. That's, I like that phrase. Yeah, I think we should yeah. do it. <laughs> <laughs> from, just to answer it from our perspective, because it is two parts. We are the co-creators. Wendy's the artistic thousand watt light bulb yeah. behind the imagery. Uh, Fred and his... Um, crew are are the technical wizards audio gurus um how elf quest hops across media is it is so rich that we have great faith in fred and company to translate words and pictures that are still into voices and music that are evolving through time as you listen. Yes. Um, we're looking forward to that process, to, to, to seeing what they come up with as much as anyone, maybe even more so, because this is, we've lived with ElfQuest for so long and we've seen it, Wendy's heard it in her mind but this is a, a concrete expression of all of that. Mm, I'm wondering if Fred will agree with this, that um, it actually has been fairly easy to translate the existing writing into uh, radio, or you could call it radio plays or, or the, the radio drama format. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason for that is I'm a huge fan of old time radio and I listen to it all the time while I work and it, it it's kind of been a, a sort of a pattern in my mind for a long time to write a script as if it were a play. 
So I, I think, um, I don't know, Fred, would you agree that it's been- Yeah, very- no, that, that was like my answer to the first question the same way, like this is, this, it just works. Like, you know, um, a, a, a very action-packed comic that relies on, you know, of, of you, know, just, you know, a lot of superhero comics wouldn't really, uh, you know, can, can work, but be more challenging because there's a lot of like multi, you know, stuff that works in like a Marvel film, you know, like blockbuster movie, doesn't necessarily make a good audio drama. This is a very deeply character rooted journey. Um, and yeah, it, you know, there's a lot of ways that people, uh, you know, it's one of the things that are interesting when I say like, this is a very visual medium, it's because I, I call it like, you know, there's this magic trick where you're just like skipping the whole optic nerve. You're like projecting images right onto someone's brain, which is like amazing. And it's also a very participatory medium because, yeah. Um, you, it doesn't work unless the audience uh, participates and 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 joins you and and yeah. you know suspends their disbelief yeah. and allows what you set up for them to complete as a picture in their mind, and you go into it knowing that um, yes, in the comic, you know, Cutter, Skywise, Lita, Nightfall, they're all they all look like they look. In the audio play, especially if there are, there, I no doubt will be people who this is their first experience with ElfQuest, like they may have new images in their mind, or they may have the images from the comics, or they may have both, or they may, like, I don't, like, it, it's, uh, it's kind of fun because those sorts of lines become blurry, and it's kind of maybe okay that there is sort of like, you know, similar, you know, all the voices are going to be true to the character, but yeah. if someone in their mind, you know, whatever they have in their mind is theirs, and that's that's for them to to come up with those pictures. Um, you know, you could also, you know, there's going to be stuff. You know, doing it like a frame by frame read through the comic like is probably going to be possible. It's not not designed to to work that way, but I think it. You know, there will be many ways to enjoy this, and many you know, depending on how you want to come at it. Um, you know, we the first. Um, you know, project of this nature I worked on was when we did uh, the adaptation of Lock and Key, you know, with Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. And that was really important to us is like, that is a comic where the writing is really important, obviously, but the, you know, people loved the visuals just as much. And, and it was really important, we know, for Joe to make it sure that, you know, that Gabriel was co always a peer and not like, you know, like there was writer driven. And we put a whole lot of thought into that of like, how, how do you convey, like in some of those scenes, there's like a double page spread of like Bodhi's brain opened up and like 75 things with like a Tyrannosaurus Rex over here and a playground over there. And like, how do you do this? And we put a lot of thought into, you know, uh, you know, layering all the sounds and all the texture and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, so there, there's a, it's, it is its own thing that will live in its own way. That will be a, you know, it'll be very true to the Elf Quest experience. If uh, I, I, I think we hope that if you really enjoy it, you will also then say, if you haven't discovered the comics already, be like, oh, I need to go check those out. And if you come to the comics, and that's what you know and love, um, you're going to both enjoy something that's beloved to you in a new way, and because there's the the novel content. And, and, and what we've chosen to use of the novel content and the, there's also gonna be a lot of stuff that's new for you too. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it is just, it, it's its own dimension and it, it, it yeah, it, it's, and whatever other adaptations may come in the future, it still will be in its mm-hmm. own incarnation. I think one of the most exciting phases of this is going to be the casting, don't you, Fred? Yeah, that's that's the next phase of this, and that's going to be happening really soon. But is is that's where the it really starts to become fun is when you hear the words <laughs> said out loud. <laughs> do, you, yeah. so do you have anybody like you don't have to say exactly who because that's probably going to be a different announcement. But do you have anybody tapped to do anything yet? Go voice cast wise. Do you have a cast together yet? We we can yeah. dream. Yeah. We can dream. There's, there's been no, as, as far as we know, uh, there's been no choices made. We have some thoughts uh, of people who we think would be good. The fans bless them. 
uh, have been suggesting voices almost since the comics first appeared in 1978. Right. Um, they're running about 10% success rate in terms of what they think this or that character should sound like. I know uh, one fan suggested The Rock ought to do Cutter's voice, and I'm like, uh, what <laughs> are you thinking? <laughs> That's, we, that, that's comical. That's funny. That's <laughs> well, when they go silly, then it's really, really hysterical, mm -hmm. like getting Orson Welles to do Sun Top. Who's the <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> rather than individual actors or uh, known voices, we like to say that there are lilts, there are timbres, there are uh, uh, styles mm -hmm. of voices. A lot of fans seem to think that because it's a fantasy that voices should have either a, a, a British or a Scottish accent, because all fantasies do, and, and a lot of actors do. Uh, we don't go that way. The, the Wolf Riders, for example, they're, they're of the woods. Yeah. They are allied with wolves. Their voices don't have any accent, but they have what Wendy likes to call a burr almost a growl. Mm -hmm. They and, might they might roll their R's, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it, that would distinguish them from the sun folk. Um, you know, have, have you ever seen The King and I? Yes, yeah. With Bill Brenner? Yeah. There's a character in there that Rita Moreno plays called Tub Tim. Mm -hmm. she, and she's this beautiful girl. Uh, uh, she was a, a kind of an influence on how Lita was designed. Mm. Oh, and okay. When, when I hear Lita's voice, I hear Rita Moreno's voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him, you see. So yeah. that's kind of how we're going to approach looking for the right people. Right. What did you say, Fred? Yeah. Uh, and you know, we're, we're casting a wide net. What's really fun about this is um, in the voice world, uh, you know, what the person can look like physically is le less important than do they have the right voice and it, it, mm -hmm. i think it can be really fun for actors to to be cast in something that that may not be they might not have been like the on-screen choice for something um and so yeah i i'm thinking by the time we start talking about who will be in the final cast it will be you know some people uh who who will be like ooh, uh, we we know them from this or that um as well as talent that you know may not be you know world famous but are have it you know have, have yeah. what we need to hear um and i will say like yeah we're working um yeah actually this is uh richard Mundy, i don't think we've told you this part just yet but we do have we're talking to a casting director out in la who's amazing who's gonna possibly <laughs> help us help support us on this and make sure we get like at, you know the level it all needs to be and um the, one of the very first parts of the conversation is that we want this to be a very inclusive cast because yeah. that's yeah. what, yeah. Um, you know, so you're, which I think is really, you know, important. And just to sort of talk like aesthetically, uh, right, we've, we've had extensive conversations about how, uh, you know, this is not the world of Tolkien. And, and, and there's people have like the, 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 the long shadow of European, you know, Viking medieval fantasy yeah. It's like, I mean, I love it. I grew up on that stuff too. And I love that material, but this is also <laughs> not that, but it's also, yeah. yeah. So we, if, so that's. If anything, ElfQuest is Native American Asian fusion. So, you know, think Native American mythology mixed with anime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that's there will be, be people who as voice actors um, have not, you know, there might not have been the right a place for them in like Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, who may find a place in the Elf Course audio movie is the the way of saying that. I um, love that. I think that's really cool. I think that so it's kind of like what you were saying about casting a wider net and the and and voice acting kind of allows for that because they're not, you know, the the physical aspect of it doesn't really matter as much mm -hmm. if at all. Like if they've got it, they've got if they've got the voice, they've got the voice, you know. And, uh, and the thing is, the cast can be diverse because ElfQuest was, if not the first high fantasy series um, 
to uh, depict uh, elves that were brown or dark skinned. Yeah. Uh, up until that time, Tolkien was the uh, was the standard, and that's a very, very, very white epic. <laughs> it is. It uh, is. We, yeah. we, our feeling about the whole thing is that if there is a female who's got a voice that has the right everything for a male character yeah we i mean we're not even drawing that boundary it's just it's wide open yeah. whatever well, it, it, it's, it's all about doing justice yeah. to the character right it's all about do, doing the character justice and whatever that yeah. takes whatever that takes yeah mm -hmm. so i love that i think i'm really excited to see this come together um you know that i'll be there you know following this project um i think we're pretty much out of time I only have you until 9.30, my time. Um, um, actually, we can go a little longer because we heard that the interview that's supposed, if, if you have questions, uh, yeah. the interview that's supposed to follow you has had to reschedule. So we've got a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying talking to all three of you. I think this is a lot of fun. Um, it's fun for us, too. Yeah. And, and I love that. <laughs> I love being able to talk to the people who make my favorite things. Because it's just it just brings it a little even closer to home for me. So I want well, to. I wanted to tell you, if you have when you get to the point where you read Final Quest. Yeah. We introduce a character named Dreon, mm -hmm. who is very very close to an autistic elf. Really. So we we you know he he has certain characteristics that you could say were on the spectrum. Yeah. So, yeah. I was so. That's really, I'm gonna, that is awesome. I think there needs to be more representation yeah. of autistic people in media. Because a lot of the representation that currently exists isn't super respectful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, a lot of the represent, A lot of the representation is, um, dare I say it, uh, in response to social, either pressure or fan service or yeah. um, even tokenism. Um, we have never put a character or defined a character in ElfQuest because we thought, oh, this type of thing is big in, in comics or, or this is popular in comics. Everything in ElfQuest is there in service of the story yeah. and the lying feeling of the story but because yeah. we are hope to be very inclusive thinking yeah uh, it makes for the best kind of storytelling i that's, agree that's where the characters come from when i think i think that at its heart to elf quest is a story about underdogs you know yes. you've got and i love under a good underdog story yeah um <laughs> i felt like I felt like an underdog my whole life because I feel like, you know, the the dictionary defines an underdog as a loser or predicted loser in a contest or struggle. Mm -hmm. And I have been underestimated my entire life. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of like, it's kind of subverting by defying kind of thing. Like you're subverting expectations by define by openly defying those expectations and saying, I can do more than you think I can. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That is the story of ElfQuest, yeah. especially the way she crafts a story. Um, you know, anybody who reads ElfQuest knows that, that uh, there are a lot of fantasy tropes yeah. that every other fantasy uses. And she'll take a trope and then just flip it 180 degrees and say, okay, see what I did there? Well, see, yeah. Fred pointed out something interesting in, in a recent email. And I'm, I'm going to be responding to that very soon, okay. Fred. Uh, the trolls, uh, he, we're all concerned with how the trolls are represented in the audio uh, movie because they have a side. You know, trolls are usually the bad guys in fantasy, you know, way back to Wagner and the ring and all that. Yeah. Trolls have always been the bad guys, the greedy ones, the, you know. Okay, now on the surface in ElfQuest, the trolls are represented as being crude and kind of ugly and so forth and so yeah. on. But they, they are so essential to the story, and they have such a side to to their particular problems with the elves. And this get, this gets worked out through the whole saga. 
Mm. But, uh, but we want to bring in hints of the fact that the trolls aren't just bad guys, even in the first five episodes. Right, Fred? Abs absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is slightly different, but I was thinking about tropes and just storytelling and like so a lot of fantasy is the sort of like chosen one kind of trope right and yeah. um you know like cutter didn't go and you know pull excalibur like it, it like and as much as like you know, cutter is is the device of which the story moves actually yeah. i've thought of it like really what the story is, is is the story of this community it's the story of the tribe of the wolf riders yeah. which is um well, actually i think that's one of the most to me one of the themes of the whole thing is that it's not a story of like yeah the 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 chosen one individual who just is like the 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 beowulf or whatever with all the magical power beyond all other mortals it's really about how resisting sort of like individualism and you know the violence of the humans and the sort of barbaric kind of violent tendencies and uh, unity <laughs> and and teaming up Mm -hmm. So when I th when I think about it, so that to me is that's what's really one of this powerful message. Just talking to what you were saying, Hayden, about like, you know, the story of the underdog. To me, the the the, the moral, uh, you know, there's of the many lessons in ElfQuest. It's um, those those of us who are on the outside can be stronger together, yes. and that's our superpower. Is you know, yeah. there, there's More always going to be strong men with a club, but we together can over over rule Absolutely. that person <laughs> more than that those of us who are on the outside are on the outside for a reason we have special qualities mm. that others don't have uh, the elves are marginalized as much for their gifts and their talents and, and their beauty as they are for the fact that they're different well people don't like what they don't understand you know mm. so yeah. if, if something is different that is, I feel like it's like a gut, it's like a knee jerk reaction to see it as bad. And yeah. I just don't like that, you know, like- Or be jealous, and, or be jealous. And, and speaking just a little more to what Fred just said, the wolf riders are modeled on the wolf, a wolf pack. Yeah. And every member of a wolf pack is essential. Most people think, oh, there's an alpha wolf, an alpha male, and he's, you know, he's the boss of everything. He has certain functions but if you go all the way down the lowest member in a wolf pack called the omega is just as essential to the health of that yeah. pack oh yeah as is are the alphas and lose any one of them and and you lose the cohesion oh, yeah. which is why the the entirety is important mm -hmm. yes and, and 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 if you remove even one member of that pack it it throws everything out of whack. Yeah. It throws, there's no equilibrium in you. You know what I mean? It throws everything out of alignment. And that's exactly when you meet the wolf riders for the first time, because just recently their chief, uh, uh, Bear Claw and a number of members have been killed. Mm -hmm. uh, the pack ha has been decimated. Uh, the, the elves are trying to come together again under this young untried chief yeah. who's really too young for the job. So we, we immediately start off the story in the midst of a crisis and a, and a literal burning at the stake. Yeah. So this yeah. thing launches. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is a, it's a rocket ship. <laughs> oh, yeah. So something I really like about the story is that it's propelled forward. It's a propulsive story. Like, it's constantly moving, you know? It's a very, yeah. very good um, action-packed story. And I just like rereading it now, I'm like falling in love with it all over again. It's amazing. Like it's, it's just so like, it's like I said earlier, it's so rich. Like everything, like every page just pops. Um, I don't know if it's been adapted in color. I have the black and white version. Oh yes, it's, oh yes. Color. Okay, I have the, I have it in, in black and white and I love it in black and white. We do too. Well, that's, that's how it originally appeared. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it has been, adapted for color over the years, but each one of those formats has an advantage. Yeah. And, uh, I'm a big fan of the original black and white art myself. Again, it, it, leaves a, it, it leaves a lot to the imagination. Your mind supplies the color, just mm. like our, our listeners' minds will supply the color and, and the uh, visuals as they right. listen to the audio movie. Well, I think that 
and, and this kind of speaks to what Fred was saying earlier, was that, you know, it asks a little bit more of you, but you get a more out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. is, is that kind of what you were saying, Fred? Yeah, yeah. And not, you know, not, you know, I like a good blockbuster movie as much as anyone, but like, this is not, you know, a Wonder Bread. Um, this yeah. is like a beautiful <laughs> sourdough, you know, lovingly crafted, you know, like brick oven, you right. know, crack, piece crack wheat, where sourdough, cracked wheat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and like you know, I get it. People are gonna like have like cheap earbuds and they're gonna listen to it while on the treadmill and whatever. But like, yeah. we will be successful if you have like the most high end. Like, this is something like there is this also this like post pandemic a very interesting trend we've seen in the data around listening is that people are actually kind of like rediscovering the joy of intentional listening. And like, I don't know, I love, I kind of find it hilarious because people, uh, everything is about the future now. And, and people like forget that like you can learn so much, actually, if you look, you look backwards and actually learn from our mistakes as, as a species. Um, and like, like, you know, I, I did do you know, college degree in, you know, the old, time radio and like that behavior of people gathering around to listen to something was like a really important thing culturally in that time and the people that you'll come across today who have this really meaningful connection with the art of audio storytelling either because it was a community experience or because they associate it with like memories of their grandparents who helped expose them to that or like some of my favorite ones are the people who uh, heard it on like late night, night AM radio. And like, they have these stories, you know, just they, they remember being like scared under their covers as kids listening to like spooky stories um, uh, played over the air. People are kind of rediscovering the joy of that post pandemic. People are so exhausted with screen time. There's a big, uh, so people were always podcasting and sort of audio media were thought of as like sort of companion pieces like, oh, you're commuting or you're jogging or you're doing something else and you can do this while you're doing that which will still be true but you can also uh like i i have a this ha hammock in my uh in my living room and i love to put on a good set of headphones close your eyes and just be swept away to another world and mm -hmm. we're in it you know everything is on zoom and everything is virtual there's a screen 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 and this is something where you can just disconnect from a screen and be fully immersed in this yeah. world and i want you know this this the product will be deserving of the very nicest headphones that you can get because it's going to have all that texture and layer and and yeah like i'm not picky about how you enjoy your content if you need to to like you know listen to it on the equivalent of like watching a blockbuster movie on your phone like i'm not going to be precious about that but you right. should know that there are going to be layers and textures and like, you know, you can really, if you want to be one of those people who like looks at the brushwork and the audio part of it, yeah. know that, that those layers oh, will be oh, there. Fred, you're make, get, uh, give it to me now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, there, give it to me now. One, one, one thing though that we all have to agree on, mm. um, there's a thing, I don't know if it's still a thing, but it was a thing where people were speeding, they were binging series and they were speeding up the DVR so they oh, could yeah. watch it one and a half or uh, twice the speed. <laughs> and I thought, that makes my brain hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if, if we ever learn that somebody's listening to our audio movie speeded up like they do the legal disclaimers on commercials on radio, <laughs> oh, no. we have to hunt them down. <laughs> That 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 is that is that is wrong. That's like that's like ketchup in the steak level on um, level. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, bite your tongue. <laughs> <laughs>